Welcome to A Walk in the Garden. I'm Liz Davey, and this show on NCTV Norfolk Community Cable is being filmed at my home in Norfolk and includes a seasonal tour through my gardens and also a little tour through the kitchen as I cook up some of the things that are either seasonal or in season in the garden. Today it is uh, about a week before Thanksgiving and we are out in the yard and we finally seen winter make an appearance. It's really cold today, which you can probably tell by my hat and my gloves, but there's still things to do outside to get ready for winter. And even through the winter, there will be a few things to do outdoors right through the season. It's not quite as intense as it is during the spring and fall, but there are things to do, like picking up sticks. We've had a lot of wind lately. I have a ton of pine needles. I have a ton of oak leaves and sticks and pine cones. So every time that I can get out, when it isn't pouring or snowing, I will be out picking up sticks and pine cones and just looking around and checking things out to make sure that everything is going okay. The sticks get put in the burn pile and they'll be burned in the spring when Norfolk has its open burning permission and you can get a slip to burn outside and we'll burn brush there. We can also use it for kindling in the fireplace. So I do make a brush pile and the little creatures also appreciate a good brush pile. They can get under it during really bad weather and get a little shelter. I'm in the herb garden today and most of the herb garden is completely covered with oak leaves and sticks and pine cones. The sticks and pine cones I'll get out of it. The oak leaves I'll leave. Oak leaves are unique in that they stay pretty crispy over the winter. They don't get matted down like the maple leaves and other leaves do. So they are a really good mulch. They hold some air in around the roots of the plants. So I'll leave those for mulch. I can still come out and get my uh, sage and my thyme for my Thanksgiving stuffing. And, but the rest of the herbs are ready to go into winter pretty much. Some of them will stay evergreen and those I haven't cut back, they'll get a good cut back in the spring. And that includes the lavender and the rue and the southern wood and also the sage, which is somewhat evergreen. And it will, again, be cut back if necessary in the spring. But we can go on picking that and drying it or just picking it and using it as long as we can get into the garden. Now let's move over to the perennial garden. In the perennial garden, I'm still working a little bit. I'm leaving many of the things that have uh, flower heads and seeds standing for the birds for the winter. Uh, they also add some seasonal interest uh, and show that there is a garden here. But the oak leaves will again cover the roots of the plants. They'll come out next spring. Most of the seeds from the butterfly weed have flown off or been collected by me. There's still a few that are opening up. And I'll leave these pods just for interest unless I need a couple for any type of craft work. I have several lavenders that need to be winterized and uh, also roses. And this is one of the roses. Most of the leaves have fallen off. Not all of them, but most of them. But it's time to put a little compost around the roots of each of the roses. And I've got a bucket here. And I just want to cover this area pretty well. This can be raked out in the spring, and I'll do this procedure for each of my roses. And this is how they will, it will help them a little bit through the winter. And uh, just smooth it around the crown of the plant. This can be done on many things that are tender. Either that or use some straw, and I'll be using some straw on the flomus and a few of the other more tender plants to help them make it through the winter. Moving over this way, I've cut down a few things like the lily stalks, things that don't have seeds. And I have some lavenders here and I use uh, old baskets. And I fill them with the oak leaves, which again are very good for insulation. And I'll just pop this over the lavender plant. I do not cut back these uh, semi-evergreen plants like lavenders and also Chrysanthemums. This one uh, tends to come back. You'll see a little uh, lovely new green foliage down at the base. I'm not going to cut it back, but I will kind of bend it over and again, co 
cover it with a bushel basket or cut or any type of basket and a rock and the rock will hold it in place. I have another lavender over here, several more chrysanthemums and I do have more baskets so I will be out getting that done uh, hopefully later today since snow is supposed to fly tonight but it is supposed to warm up tomorrow and for the weekend so I do have a little time left to get these last minute chores done in the garden. Another thing I can do now is start thinking ahead towards holiday arrangements. This is a red twig dogwood and it has lost its leaf, leaves, but we can start picking some of the twigs, which look very nice in winter arrangements, especially the ones outdoors. It needs to be pruned back anyway, so you might as well use the prunings in a useful fashion. I'm also collecting some of the cones that are all over the ground and we'll use those in winter decorations and perhaps even make uh, a wreath from the pine cones. Uh, several years ago they were very popular. With all the pine cones that have fallen this year, I'm predicting they may become popular again because everybody seems to have, if they have a pine tree, lots of cones. I've left the flocks. Again, it has seed heads and also the Autumn Joy. This is uh, Autumn Joy sedum, and I will be picking some of that, removing the leaves, and using that in winter arrangements. Once it dries a bit, I found that it takes to spray paint really well, and a uh, deep, deep red burgundy spray paint really looks nice on it. And again, they can be used in holiday arrangements. Again, most of them will be cut back in the spring or finished cutting back, but I'll save these for winter arrangements. Other things that you can pick from your garden would be evergreens that need pruning. Do a little pruning on those and they can be brought in. And holly, if you have holly or boxwood, that too can uh, be a nice thing to bring in and add to your holiday arrangements. Any types of seed pods that you have can also be picked. Uh, some of them take real well to a little uh, gold spray paint and you have something that is unique and uh, isn't quite like everything else that you find that's glittery but has a little style to it. Now let's move over to the vegetable garden. Oh, incidentally, the poppies have put up their fall foliage. It's fine. Uh, it will not be hurt, it will freeze, it will disappear, only to come back again next spring along with the shoots and the blooms of the poppies. But if you have oriental poppies, don't worry about foliage that's come up. Also, some of the bulb foliage has emerged, particularly grape hyacinths. They always put up winter foliage. You can see where they are when you're planting your bulbs. And they too will return once spring comes with their blooms. Now we can head to the vegetable garden. Vegetable garden, most of the uh, dying or dead plants have been removed. Some leaves have been put on the garden and we're getting it ready to be rototilled for the fall if the weather cooperates. If not, it will wait until spring. But there are a few things to be picked and one of them is Brussels sprouts and I saved this one out of the rest. And what I'll do with this one to pick it, you'll notice I've got sprouts on it, but I want to remove the leaves. We'll put those in the compost. The leaves come off pretty easy, but there's no sense taking those into the house nor the thick root. So I will use my clipper to cut off the root. And then I can bring it in with the others and we'll take the sprouts right off the stalk. They may be a little frosty this morning, but they should be okay. I'll be storing those inside 
in the refrigerator or possibly in the garage until I can get them cut off the stalk. And we can use those for as long as they last or uh, blanch them and freeze them. We also have kale and it's still perfectly good. I have two different kinds, the red lancinato kale and also some kale over this way. That's almost finished. I've been picking and using that quite regularly. We also have parsley. And I think uh, the rabbits have been enjoying some of it. I'll leave that over the winter and it should come up again next spring and give us a spring crop. I did pick quite a bit of it. I wash it, drain it somewhat, and store it in a glass jar in the refrigerator. And unless I use it all up, it should last until Christmas. I have both the curly parsley and the flat leaf Italian. I'm gonna move over here and the strawberries. There's a reason they call them strawberries because they need to have some winter protection. And I've actually got salt marsh hay instead of straw, or you could use straw. And I'll just be spreading a nice blanket of this on the strawberry plants. And this is something I'll probably want to get finished today as we are looking for some cold weather and some snow. This will stay all winter and then we'll rake it back in the spring. Uh, the garlic, of course, has been done, coated with straw, and that stays all winter as well. Uh, my husband, who does the rototilling, knows that if he sees anything covered with straw, he should not till it up. So hopefully that works well and we save our berries and garlic for next year. I had dahlias over here and uh, we had canna lilies as well. Those were pulled, I think last month, we dug those up and uh, dried them for about a week in my garden shed when the weather wasn't quite as cold. And then they've gone into a cool, very cool back bedroom, one that we don't uh, heat too much. So try to keep it as cool as possible. If I had a, a cool cellar, that would be the place to put them. My garage is a little bit too cold for them and as is my front entry. So I do use the back bedroom, and so far it's been pretty successful in keeping them over. I've picked up flower pots and emptied them. Any clay pots tend to fr hold water and then they'll freeze and break. So clay pots should not stay out. The plastic ones can be emptied and just turned upside down and they should be fine all winter as long as they don't blow away. I have a large, trash barrel that I put a lot of the smaller pots in to keep the wind from blowing them around the place. My brush pile is growing and again that will continue to grow until spring if we continue to have uh, wind and branches coming off of trees. Some of these can be cut up and used in the fireplace but most of them will get burned next year. Now let's head back over towards some of the potting potted area I'm almost ready to get my uh, window boxes and planters ready for winter. Uh, any mums that were added this fall do not survive the winter. As you can see, they really don't put out much in the way of spreading roots. And so these will just be composted. And I will, however, save their uh, container. Always use extra pots. But these will just go into the compost. I can use that basket again to cover one of my lavenders. Amazingly, just when I'm ready to pull the plants out, some of my window box plants are still blooming. This red verbena and the white alyssum are still putting out a few blooms. I will be removing them shortly though because I want to start putting greens in the pots. Uh, this is a, actually an annual and I decided not to save it. I'm going to leave it in the pot and see what it does all winter just as winter interest. I'm sure it will die, but it may add some spikiness to the arrangement. I am starting to add trimmings of evergreens and I'll be filling these pots with evergreens in the next couple weeks as I decorate for the holidays. Now let's head back by the pond. The pond has a skim of ice on it this morning. Uh, this is the first time we've seen that. And that says it's time to put in the little heater that I use. And this is thermostatically controlled, so it just goes on when there is ice. I still have the net on the pond. That does need to come off now that it's starting to freeze. 
and I really don't want snow piling up on it. But I'm going to put this down into the pond, set it on top, it does float, and then I'll bring my cord over and plug it in to the outlet over on this side of the shed. And it should be long enough to reach. So now that it's plugged in, it will say keep a little hole in the pond and this will uh, give the air a chance to get out. There are fish in here this year and the fish are moving really slowly under the ice. I don't know if uh, you can get a close up of them, but they look, they're just kind of in suspended animation in the cold water. They're not eating anymore, so you don't feed the fish after the temperature drops below about 50. They do just fine. Uh, you'll see them under the ice, and they do need, however, to have a hole in the ice for the gases to get out of the uh, area. When you have something living, they, they produce gas in uh, their life process, and that needs to escape. If it does not, it will build up and the fish will be killed. So you have to keep a little hole in the ice. I will get out and take the net off and pull out my support and then the pond will be all ready for winter. Again, most of the leaves are on the perennials. We've tried to get most of it off of the grass. Uh, things keep falling from the sky, however, so we don't get all of them every year. There will be quite a bit of spring cleanup next year. Now we can head back in. You'll notice a few evergreen plants as we go. Uh, Lakothway is a plant that grows in the shade where it's a little damp and that uh, describes this area. And that too can be picked for winter decorations. It looks very nice in with some other greens. It gives a little variation to evergreens and pine trees that are used for decorating and making container decorations. So let's head into toward the house and we'll stop a minute at the bird feeder. Right bud? I've started feeding the birds. Uh, this isn't very fancy but it does the job and if I'm starting to have problems with things like raccoons I can always lift this feeder up and bring it in the house overnight. So that's why this works rather than putting it on a post permanently. I have seed in the container. I have sunflower in this one and mixed seed in the hanging planter on the house. And now it's time, that, now that it's cold, to add some suet or one of the commercially prepared seed cakes. I also use leftover pie crust. They seem to like that about as well. And it does have fat in it. Uh, and you can make your own peanut butter seed mixture as well and put that out. They love it. Sometimes people smear it on the trees and that draws some of the little climbing birds, the chickadees and the nuthatches that really need a little fuel to survive the cold weather. Now let's go inside and do a little decorating and a little cooking and get ready for Thanksgiving. When you can't garden outside, it's time to garden inside. And so I'm setting some amaryllis bulbs today and the amaryllis are the ones with the tall lily-like flowers that uh, bloom in the fall, in the winter, usually often around Christmas. I like mine to bloom a little later, so I'm setting them now. The bulbs are the ones that I uh, dug. I had them outdoors for the summer, and they formed some really nice roots, but now they're ready to be planted in a container. And then later on, I will water, water them and uh, bring them in. So the first thing I want to do is put some potting soil in this pot to give them a, a base. They don't have to be too deep. In fact, you want the top part of the bulb to stick right out of the soil. So we'll add a little bit more. Break up any chunks. This is just uh, commercial potting soil. Happens to be coast of Maine, which I like. But any of the ones that are available will work. 
And I'm planting three different ones in this pot. You can also plant them in individual pots. I have a few that are in individual pots. So I've covered the bottom of the soil and then I'll spread these out and spread their roots out a bit. We don't always get a bloom every year from the ones that I've saved over, but more often than not, especially if the bulbs are large. And then I want to cover those exposed roots with more potting soil. After they were dug, they were uh, dried in the shed for a little while so that all the foliage would come off. You can also just grow them in a glass of water, but they tend to get pretty tippy when they get tall, so I prefer that they have a, a firmer foundation. You may be lucky to get an amaryllis bulb as a gift. They are one of the more popular Christmas gifts that's available. I'm not going to water this yet. You don't want to really water it until you're ready for it to start growing. This potting soil is a little bit damp, so it may start them growing a little bit, but that isn't what we desire right now because I prefer the blooms when there's nothing else in bloom and the Christmas decorations have all been taken down. The other thing we need to think about are the plants that we took cuttings of about two months ago. Those have been growing nicely. And you'll note this one has three different plants in this pot. And I'm gonna turn it out of the pot and divide it into the three plants. And they've all rooted nicely. These are uh, coleus. And I'll put some of the soil back in the pots. And a little more from our bag of soil. I've been growing the cuttings now under the lights. I have lights on. 12 to 14 hours a day on these. And we need one more pot. I have them on a tray, so I don't have to worry too much about... Uh, and then I'll just fill in with some of the soil on top to even it out. So instead of three little plants, I'm now going to have, or instead of one, we have three. And these will continue to grow. Now they have a little more room to spread out. And I'll use the soil that's here since I'm making a mess. And these will go back under the lights. I have other cuttings that I'm also going to be repotting. I'll probably run out of space under the lights, in which case I'll just have to put them by a sunny window. Fortunately, I do have a lot of sun, so I can put them there. If I didn't have the sun, I'd have to set up more lights. You'll notice that this one has already been pinched. And by pinching, I mean there's a tiny little growth in the middle of each pair of leaves. And by pinching that out, I just did it with these two center ones. This causes the plant to branch out. And my cuttings, as they grow, I'll be going through and finding these little spots 
that are, as they start to grow, this one's just starting to branch, and this will give a bushier plant. So you want to keep uh, pinching them back as they grow. And then they will be ready to set out in the spring. And you'll already be ahead of the game when that comes. The next thing I want to do are some centerpieces and uh, decorations. Now a centerpiece for the Thanksgiving table shouldn't be too tall. It uh, needs to be, if you put your elbow on the table, it should be no higher than about your hand because you want people to be able to see over the centerpiece to the person across the table. It makes a lot of sense. I've put some oasis in this container. And I'm going to fill it in with some dried materials and some fresh. The oasis is the foam that is uh, wet. And I'll just start with one of these, some of the dry things. And I also have some berries. These are all things I picked out of the yard. And uh, this will be kind of the, the center spot. Some of these may be a little long, unless we want the uh, arrangement to be wider. And you can make it wider as you go. But I think I'll cut some of these back to keep it down. Put one over that way and another one on the other side. We can cut back. I also picked some of the sedum and I have some flowers. And I think I'll start putting these in. Obviously we won't need the whole stem of these. Probably three, to, three or four of them will be enough. And we'll cut those and put them into the foam. Again, you don't want any of the leaves on the stems when you put them in the arrangement. And I'm going to take three of these large daisies. This is just a supermarket bunch of flowers. And I'm going to add, then just keep adding some of the things to fill it in. I've got more hydrangea here. This again came off my hydrangea plant. And I picked it when it was still green. They're now all brown. And this will turn brown eventually. But we can tuck some of it in around the base. To kind of cover up the foam along the edge. Perhaps a little more under here. Just to form a little. have some of the uh, bronzier ones that we can add in. And this is the Autumn Joy that can be used to fill in. Again, this is just as it was picked, and it's starting to dry. And these are uh, Black Eyed Susan pods. Put in a few of those. Add some variety of shape. And Let's see. This was a stilby, which is an annual, and these are its flower shoots that are dried. 
can, there are so many things that you can pick from the garden just to add variety to an arrangement. This is broom corn that I grew. I don't know if I want that one in the middle or not. Maybe not. A little more of the autumn joy. Makes a nice filler. And another large one of the orange mums. See the front of it. You need a little more over here. It's hard to, for me to work uh, from the back. It takes a little practice to do that. Uh, these are fern fronds, uh, a particular fern that just grows wild in my yard. Uh, has these bloom. Bloom stalks. They aren't really fronds, but they're bloom stalks. And again, they can add to an arrangement. And I also picked a few winter berries. And winter berries are a type of wild holly. I usually, they're very nice in Christmas decorations. However, the birds usually eat mine all up before I'm ready to use them. So I don't have them at Christmas. And I thought, well, I'll use a little at, at Thanksgiving time. And again, we need to make the pieces a little bit shorter. The idea is a few supermarket uh, blooms and a lot of pickings, wild pickings from your garden, and you can have a very nice arrangement. It's very unique because it came from the things you grew. So there's our centerpiece, and we have a lot of mess to clean up. Well, we need another one of these. One of the floral rules is uh, that may be broken is to work in uh, threes and fives or odd, odd numbers of plants as you add plants, even as you plant plants in the garden. If you're working for a group, you try to make it an uneven number. It generally looks a little nicer to do it that way. Now, I still have some of these blooms left. I have already put some of the uh, dried things, taller stems of dried things into this vase. And I will add a few of the winter berries in front. And then I'm going to add several of these tall yellow mums. And I do have oasis in the bottom of this, which has been soaked. And this would be not be a good centerpiece piece. Oops, that needs to be tucked in more there. It would not be good for a centerpiece because it's way too tall, but it would work on a sideboard or a buffet if you have it up against the wall. And we'll put the next one in too. few pieces more of the broom corn that I can put in. That were a little too big. So there we've gotten two arrangements uh, by buying just one small supermarket brocade. 
Now let's put those over on our serving area and go into the kitchen and make a few things. Today we're gonna to do some, I, I guess I could call it Thanksgiving odds and ends, uh, before and after, but I, I wanna make the house smell like Thanksgiving, so I'm gonna make some uh, spiced cider. And I'm gonna start with six cups of apple cider, and I'm putting them in my crock pot. I found this is the easiest way to do it. Six cups of cider and two cups of cranberry juice. I'm going to add a quarter cup of sugar and let's put some of these things in the dishwasher. The sink. And then I want to tie a, a bag of, of spices together and I'm going to use a teaspoon of whole allspice and this is cheesecloth. And I was able to find a cheesecloth that was a little uh, more tightly woven. Some of the cheesecloth is not too tightly woven and the spices tend to fall through. So you want to get one, if you can, that's a little more tightly. And then I want about 16 cloves. And some of the directions say to stud the oranges, but I find I like to put my cloves in the cheesecloth instead. And you may count them out if you wish, or just put in about a teaspoon. Uh, studying the oranges, the cloves always fall out, and so you have cloves floating around in it. I don't like that. And about six inches of cinnamon stick. And again, you can kind of guess. And break it up into little pieces. And I'm going to tie this into a little bundle. I like to make this on Thanksgiving morning and have it ready for my Thanksgiving guests when they arrive. But I want to leave a string out because you don't want to leave this in there too long. After about an hour, it's had enough spice embedded in it and uh, you really don't want to cook it any longer than that. And I have it turned on high, but I don't think I've plugged it in. So we'll do that. and. This really gets you in the mood for Thanksgiving. And I can either put the lid on for a little bit until it starts to heat and leave it vented, or leave the lid off altogether. The other thing I want to add is a teaspoon of bitters. And this is kind of optional, but it does add a little flavor, and it was in my original recipe. So we'll put that in and let it steep away. And before you know it, it will smell like Thanksgiving in here. The next thing I'm going to make is a cranberry mincemeat, and this is a Nigella Lawson recipe. And I'm going to start my stove and put a quarter cup of port wine into the pan and add a half a cup of dark brown sugar, which does not wish to come out of the measuring cup. There we are. And I'm going to turn on the heat and kind of dissolve the sugar in the port. and stir it around a little to hasten the process. This is a recipe for cranberry mincemeat, although my husband claimed that it doesn't taste at all like mincemeat, which he's not as fond of, and uh, it tastes really good. So this has a lot of fruit in it, no meat, uh, original mincemeat had suet and other things, meat, actual meat in it, uh, but this does not. It was a way of preserving those items. But this is more of a fruit sauce, almost a chutney-like thing. And then we're, we're going to add some the fruits. And again, it has absolutely no meat and no fat, really. I'm going to add three cups of cranberries. And these are fresh cranberries. You can also use frozen cranberries. It'll take a little longer to come to a boil if you put them in frozen. I've washed them, and I thought uh, this is a good advertisement for Massachusetts as well. This would make a very nice gift. Uh, it would be good spread on toast 
or used in cookies. I'm going to use it in a little while in some tarts. I made it up some up the other day. A half a cup of raisins. A half a cup of currants. Those are the ones that you get in the Irish scones. And a half a cup of dried cranberries. So it really capitalizes on the cranberries. Then we want to add some spice. And the spices would be a teaspoon of cinnamon, a teaspoon of ginger, and a half teaspoon cloves. The grated peel of one clementine. the juice of that same clementine. And that's our mixture so far. And we want to bring this to a low boil. And the cranberries are going to cook and pop. And then I'm going to simmer this for about 20 minutes. And after it's simmered 20 minutes, I'll come back and add a few more ingredients. While our batch of mincemeat is simmering, I'm going to make some tarts using some of the same cranberry mincemeat that I made several days ago. This does keep in the refrigerator for quite a while. And what I'm going to use is a little... Uh, cookie cutter in a round and I'm going to use a, my mini cupcake pan to put the little tarts in and I think I need to roll it a little bit thinner. You want it quite thin. This uh, pastry recipe was also included with the mincemeat recipe in the Nigella Lawson cookbook but it's pretty much a basic pie pastry made with orange juice instead of water and using part shortening and part butter. But a regular pie pastry would work just fine. And let's see how we're doing here. We want 12 circles and then I'm going to fit them into the uh, mini muffin pan carefully. And I used a cookie cutter that has a little scalloped edge, which is kind of cute on the tarts. If you are baking tarts or, for that matter, cupcakes in a cupcake pan, and you don't have enough dough to fill it or enough batter to completely fill the pan, before you bake it, put some water in the empty cup. It keeps the pan from burning and works out well to give the volume to the uh, pan that's needed for the timing. There's always somebody that likes mincemeat that comes to Thanksgiving or Christmas, but a lot of people don't. So to make a whole pie, you'd usually end up with a lot of leftovers. This is one way to serve mincemeat, and you could use just the regular canned mincemeat instead of this homemade cranberry mincemeat. And just make a few tarts instead of a whole pie. That way your uh, mincemeat lover would be perfectly content, and you wouldn't have a lot left over. This is a little different, and you may find that people who don't care for mincemeat actually do like this concoction. And I'm going to put about a teaspoon of the cranberry mincemeat in each little compartment. Each recipe of the mincemeat makes enough uh, 
or about 50 of these little tarts according to the recipe. But you could also use it in cookies or make a whole pie with it. I think I could even stand a whole pie with this one. And then I'm going to use a little star cutter and cut out a dozen stars. And I'll probably have to re-roll it. But with so much uh, butter, re-rolling is not a problem. You could use any other little small cutter you wanted. Small shape. I'm going to gather these together. And these are going to go in a 400 degree oven for 10 minutes. And that's all it takes. They can be frozen when they're finished. The next thing I'm going to make are some dinner rolls. And these two can be made a little bit ahead of time. And I've already made my dough. And this was a, uh, you can use any dough, roll dough recipe uh, made from a box. This happens to be a uh, recipe that has some pumpkin included in the recipe itself along with the other ingredients milk brown a little brown sugar pumpkin flour and I want to divide this into 10 pieces I'm going to make some little pumpkin shapes so we'll try to get 10 somewhat even shapes and I'm not doing too well here I'm going to have to Make them a little bit smaller. And I'll put them on my baking sheet and flatten them with the back of my hand. And then the next step is to cut them uh, about a half inch in in eight different places on each roll. It helps if you go in quarters and then cut the quarters back in an eighth. This dough has already risen once in the uh, bowl and I actually had it in the refrigerator overnight which also works. You could also use uh, the rolls, I believe you can get frozen ones. and then just shape them and they, if they come in little round balls, why well, it's just a matter of cutting them. What we're gonna get when we're finished are little pumpkin shaped rolls. Okay, they've all been cut. Now we wanna poke a hole in the middle of each one with our finger, not all the way through, but very deep. This will be the top of the pumpkin eventually. And then I'm going to put these in a warm place with a towel over them for about an hour to rise. And once they've risen, they're going to look about double in size. And that little indentation may be gone, in which case I'm going to poke it again, just a little bit. and brush them with a beaten egg with a little water mixed in. They will rise up even more in the oven. And we'll put them in a 350 oven for about 10 minutes. Now that our mincemeat is cooked down and all the cranberries have uh, popped and we can kind of stir it around to make sure all of them have, I'm going to add a few more ingredients. I'm going to add two tablespoons of honey. tablespoons of brandy, half a teaspoon of vanilla extract, and a 
about an eighth of a teaspoon of almond extract. And that finishes our cranberry mincemeat. And I'm going to just let that set. And then I will pack it into a canning jar with a lid and store it in the refrigerator. I've sterilized the canning jar by washing it well in the dishwasher and then uh, drying it in a 175 degree oven. Now it's time to take out the mincemeat tarts. You can see they are nice and done. And the next thing I'm going to work on is a poultry pot pie. This can be done with leftover turkey or leftover chicken. I am using chicken today because we did have a roast chicken. And I'm going to start by using any leftover gravy. If I didn't have leftover gravy, I would melt two tablespoons of butter or margarine, whatever you use. Add two tablespoons of flour until it's mixed and then about a cup and a half of broth, vegetable broth, chicken broth, whatever you have. I happen to have the uh, gravy that was left over, and if you have leftover gravy from Thanksgiving, that works well. Once that starts to cook, a pot pie is really easy to make. I'm going to set this over so you can see a little better. It will uh, just let the gravy cook. If you wish, you can also saute a few onions to put in, but it's totally not necessary. Then I want to add uh, two or three cups of chopped chicken or turkey. Either way, when you're tired of turkey sandwiches, this is another way you can serve that leftover turkey. And I'm going to add about a cup of frozen peas. And a cup of cooked carrots. And uh, these, since I didn't serve them with the meal where we ate the chicken, I just uh, cut them up and microwaved them for about three minutes. We'll stir that around and let it come to a boil. One of the secrets of making a good pot pie, I think, is to have the ingredients hot when you put it into the pie crust. I do have a bottom pie crust already made right here and I need to make up the crust for the top. I've cut with the fork a third of a cup of shortening into uh, one cup of flour with a half teaspoon of salt and now I'm going to be adding some water and I'll start with about four tablespoons of cold water. And mix that around. Mix it lightly but well. And for those of you who have had children or played with children, I have something that's a little thicker than the consistency of Play-Doh. <laughs> I'll bring it over and roll it up. We'll get that ready to put on our pie. Roll it a little larger than the pie. And when this is all bubbly and boiling, I 
Again, you may wish to season it with a little extra salt and pepper, or perhaps a little uh, thyme would be a good spice to put in it. But this is going to go into our pie crust. I'm going to take it over to the other side now and put the top crust on. And if you wish to have it sealed a little better, any type of pie, you can always add a little moisture in the way of water to this edge of the crust. Take it over here and stretch our crust over the pie. You'll notice I haven't cut in any vents yet. And I'll kind of fold it around, folding any edges under, taking off any pieces that are too big. You can use it to patch if you need to. And then I can cut a design in the top. I generally cut just a little kind of wheat design in the top of the pie. A few vent holes. This will be ready to go into the oven and bake for about half an hour at 400 degrees. Now let's get the rolls out of the oven. Our little pumpkin rolls. And I want to brush these with a little melted butter. And butter hardened up. And we have a few that didn't quite make pumpkin stat status, but most of them look like a little pumpkin. And as the last thing, we want to put a little stem on our pumpkin, and this is half a pecan, which we'll just poke right in. Our cider's about ready. I'm going to add some uh, orange slices. These could have been added at the beginning as well, but they are kind of nice to have floating. Uh, if you cut them really thin, people can put them in their cup along with their cider. So we have our hot cider. It's steeping and ready for people to arrive. Uh, the cranberry mincemeat tarts and I have some of the rolls here and some of the finished tarts that have already cooled and what I'm going to do is sprinkle a little powdered sugar over the top. For a final setting and let's bring our flour arrangement over too and our cranberry mincemeat. We have some in the pan but I can also have some here in the jar. I think it would probably be very good served along with the pot pie. And let me bring my flower arrangement over too. Wishing you a happy Thanksgiving. This, I'm Liz Davey and you've been watching A Walk in the Garden on NCTV. And I would like to say and express my thanks to NCTV for filming these shows for the last 80 episodes. <laughs>